Chapter 4. Home Again, Home Again. Traveling across the wasteland felt different while inside a hovering convoy truck than it had on foot. For starters, air conditioning. When riding out into a desert, it's best to take a vehicle that can provide some creature comforts of home. Cold air, bottles of water, shade from the blistering sun, and potentially a safety net for those who don't want to deal with giant mutant yeti. Dave spent the 12-minute hover back to Central in silence, thinking upon the events of the day. Inspector Green attempted to talk to him, asking questions about how he was feeling or if he was hurt, but Dave knew that these were mostly platitudes, as once he was back home, he'd have to answer for leaving in the first place. The memory of his meeting with the captain right before he left was an unpleasant reminder of Dave's youthful innocence and general ignorance of the dangers abound. All Dave could do was let those moments play over and over again. Like hell I'm letting you out there alone, the captain shouted, a vein above his eye patch throbbing. But if you just listen to me... Dave was cut off short by the sound of the captain's fist pounding indiscriminately against the massive oak desk that separated the boy and his boss. I said no, goddammit! The silence hung in the air like a raid siren. Eventually, after the longest four and a half seconds of his life, Dave Toriyama managed to eke out the phrase, I know I can do this. The captain leaned back in his gothic chair, turning away from the sight of Dave and out the window at the back of the room. From here, the captain could observe the entirety of Central City and beyond into the wastelands. You can't go, the captain spoke quietly, almost imperceptibly but audible enough for Dave to hear its finality. A trip into the wasteland, it's not like a walk in the park. You'll die out there alone if you're not ready. I'm sorry, Dave. Your assignment to Shiel is not approved. Dave bowed his head, defeated. Those words, lasting in the space between them, pushed both away from any healthy continuance of dialogue. Spinning on his heels, tears streaming down his face, Dave left the office without a sound. Not a walk in the park, Dave thought in the present, the voice of the captain echoing in his skull. The sting of refusal remained a pain in his heart. You see, there weren't many who were approved to go on an outside assignment. Since Dave had arrived at UPX, only a handful had even gone out on one, and none of the other delivery men had ever come back from the wastelands. It was assumed that the young, scrawny lack of muscles in a skin suit that was Dave Toriyama wouldn't have survived either. I almost didn't, he thought. I guess the captain was right. Dave's fists clenched. The powerful feeling of rage that came from failure bubbled up inside our young hero. Closing his eyes, Dave remembered the conversation with his best friend and mentor, Hosen, before he left. A conversation which would be the key reason Dave took on the assignment against the captain's wishes. You can't really even believe how many sprats she ate. I think, I think I'm in love. Hosen slapped Dave's back joyfully. Dave laughed instinctively. Well, I'm glad you and Alyssa are getting along, dude. Dave gave a smirk, eyeing Hosen knowingly. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm not sure either of us is, you know, looking for... The two had been sitting outside for lunch, enjoying a bright and sunny day, but a cloud had been hanging over Dave's head, and he had spoken very little to his best friend. What's wrong, man? Hosen always knew when something was bothering his little buddy. Dave sighed. I wanted to take on an assignment, but, but the captain... What did you have nothing to do with it, huh? Yeah, it sounds like the captain. After a brief pause, Dave looked at his friend with tears in his eyes. How long until he trusts me? Why doesn't he even believe in me? Hosen sat next to his friend and wrapped his arm around his shoulders. Dave, you gotta remember that the captain is responsible for so many people and so many things. He's, he's worried he can't keep an eye on you if you're out in the wastelands. But I came here from the wastelands. I made it on my own as a kid. I, 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 I can do a simple delivery to the south, to this, this Shiel? Nodding in agreement, Hosen replied, well, Of course you can, but even a simple assignment a mile or two away can be the difference between life or death. If you really want to prove to him that you're capable, you just need to keep doing your job well, here, in Central. 
Dave opened his eyes and stared at the barren landscape outside. It passed so quickly, yet every inch Dave could feel an attachment with. He had seen it all. He had walked it all. Every moment of my life has been someone who didn't believe in me, Dave thought obsessively. The captain should have believed in me. I didn't need his help. The vehicle approached the walled structure which protected Central from the wasteland and its horrors. Towering over the desert to protect the city, the wall had stood for 100 years. Occasional patchwork could be seen in spots where some form of an attack had taken place, but overall it was still the same wall that had been erected in the early days of the city. Large turrets manned by an android police force stood guard over the entryway, which Dave noticed as the hover truck pulled through. Central City had been designed to repel invaders and keep the people inside safe. To do this, once someone entered through the front gate and they were taken below ground into a tunnel system designed to act as a maze, confusing anyone who didn't know the way through. It took five minutes to make it through the tunnels. The hover truck whipped and whirled at breakneck speeds, likely piloted by an extremely gifted driver. No matter how much he attempted to understand the layout, it still managed to confuse the hell out of Dave. But at last, after three chapters and a page or two of backstory, the hover truck pulled out of the underground structures and the city proper towered in their view. A beautiful city built at the end of the war which had remained strong and intact, bustling with all manner of modern conveniences. As the truck pulled to a stop and extended the landing rails, Dave looked out the window and could see a network of high-speed pneumatic tubes that carried carriages of people from one location to another. They called it public transportation, but it was a nauseating roller coaster to the weak stomach Daves of the city. The bright lights of neon signs for every type of business lined the streets down busy markets where citizens of the city shopped carelessly. Robot police, similar to the ones who had come with Inspector Green to free Dave, patrolled the streets to keep them safe. It was the amorphous shape of commerce and citizenry that permeated the entire city. This is what living looked like in this time. A confusing bustle of people, unaware of the dangers, just a wall away. Stepping out of the truck, Dave slowly shuffled towards one of the transport tubes. Inspector Green caught up to him almost immediately with departing advice. Look, kid, for what it's worth, I, I think you were very brave. A slight smirk crossed Dave's lips. Thanks, but you're not the one I need to think that. You think the captain doesn't see it? I've known that man for a long time, kid. I can tell when he cares about someone. But how long do you have to know him before you see when he thinks I'm just a child? The inspector sighed. You're young. All these anxieties over the people in charge, you don't realize how silly it all sounds. Take a deep breath and trust that the captain wants what's best for you. With a final look of assurance, the inspector placed his hand on Dave's shoulder. Good luck, kid. With that, the inspector turned to walk off into the crowded city and disappeared. <laughs> Good luck. Right. Sure thing, thought Dave with an intense feeling of sarcasm like any amount of luck will save me from a terrible punishment. Dave took a deep breath and trekked across the street into the line of citizens preparing to board the nearest tube. People were getting out of the transport container, freeing up room for the new passengers. Not that much different than when I first got here, huh? mused our protagonist. He wasn't incorrect. Immediately he was sent back into a deep memory of the first time he used the pneumatic tube system. It must have been the first day he had arrived, and Dave stood in line behind a plethora of citizens. Two elder gentlemen stood in front of Dave, both hunched over onto canes, suspenders holding up their wasted high pants. You know, back in my day, these were tin can trains. They put wheels on the tin cans and called them train cars, but nothing beats the pneumatic system. The first old man snorted after expo dumping like that. The second man turned to the first, having trouble hearing what he said. Huh? A new matrix system? No, you don't. Pneumatic. You know, because of the way it travels. The first man held a look of incredulity. Your face is a new mattress. <laughs> Dave chuckled then, as he did now, remembering that core moment. He often wondered what happened to those old men. A young boy, likely around nine or ten, 
shook timidly as he hid behind a bench. Hey, kid, c come here, Dave called out. The kid gave him a confused look, but slunk over. He appeared to be hiding from someone. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you away, responded our protagonist. Tell you what, I'll let you slip on after me, okay? The young boy smiled, nodding his head. The doors to the system opened, and a baker's dozen of people piled out. Placing a badge he retrieved from the satchel against the metal detector at the entrance, a beeping noise then indicated that Dave had bought his ticket. The boy slipped in quiet, quickly so as not to miss out on the opportunity. With a knowing smile, Dave boarded the train carriage and took a window seat that looked out towards the east side of the city. The door shut with a swoosh, and the tube carriage took off. Reaching incredible speeds inside the tube, the whole thing felt smooth, gliding across the city. Dave could see the places he's been and the world he's grown into, all while traveling at 115 miles per hour. There was the cafe that he bust tables at in exchange for some food and water. Across from the indoor mall was the alleyway where he and the parkour gang liked to hang out. And of course, it wasn't a trip around Central without seeing a group of ninja harassing some innocent pedestrian just trying to get home. Sigh, city ninja. They're the worst. Dave couldn't contain his general disgust. With those images now in his head, Dave closed his eyes and remembered the time his best friend Hosen and their co-worker, Alyssa, all went to the East Side Diner during a thunderstorm. It was a pleasant memory, and David said something quite hilarious that got Hosen to laugh and... Arriving at the Commerce District, the speaker above Dave spat. The memory faded. Dave was back in the present. Once the carriage came to a complete stop, the doors opened, the seat belts released. Dave stepped out, clutching his satchel bag tightly with anxiety and regret. He's going to yell at me, he said to himself, but noticed he was speaking aloud. Two other passengers on the platform looked at him. Dave simply walked on. Each step took him closer towards UPX headquarters. Dave could feel the watchful eye of his captain glaring at him from the 20th floor. He took a big breath and stepped forward with confidence. The door to UPX swooshed open. The lobby of the building was a beautiful sight to most who beheld it. Marble floors, brilliant limestone columns, even gold-plated doors to the elevators. In Central City, luxury was a difficult commodity to come by. Dave strode past many of the people he saw every day. He waved to a few co-workers who smiled at him or called out his name, but nothing deterred him from making his way straight to the elevator in the back of the lobby. This was the one that went straight up to the top floor. Fear overcame Dave's body. He stood motionless, staring at the reflection of himself in the doors. A tall older man with a balding head and a massive handlebar mustache walked past Dave on his way to some assignment or another. He gave a large slap against Dave's back and said, Ho! Oh, good to see you, kid! Reaching out with both arms, Dave managed to catch himself prior to slamming his face against the doors. The force of such a slap could push a man forward. Jeez, Bosh! You don't have to hit so hard! Bosh laughed a uh, full belly laugh at this, vibrating the eardrums of everyone within range. He kept walking, laughing as he did. That was Bosch. The golden doors opened, and the pit of Dave's stomach dropped. Twenty floors slowly and painfully passed later, the elevator reached the top floor. Seemingly, the elevator had forgotten to bring along Dave's usual bravado and courage, must have left it at the first floor. He timidly stepped out and into the thick of things. Uniformed agents of UPX filled the space, moving frantically around as they grabbed new delivery orders and assigned themselves to those deliveries. Some were agents who remained at computer screens in their cubicles, while the rest were runners themselves, getting ready to race through the city. Dave felt unseen. He used this to his advantage, slipping through the amorphous blob of moving persons. Dave managed to bypass almost any concerned parties, and reached the large, imposing doors of the captain. Taking another large breath, Dave closed his eyes and stepped forward. The door opened. Inside, the room was dark. The usual industrial lighting was turned off, mostly for dramatic effect. At the far end of the room was the oak desk 
that the captain sat behind. His high-backed chair was turned to hide its occupant from whomever had entered. But Dave could tell that his captain was there. The wisps of smoke from his cigar slithered above the top of the chair. The captain was sitting just ten feet away, staring out the window. Dave stepped a few feet from the desk. Sweat began to drip down his brow. The sound of the AC unit running was the only noise. Dave gulped. Then Dave waited. Time slowly passed, and the smoke continued to slither. The moment just before Dave decided to speak, the chair turned. The squeak was deafening. Captain Grizz Kuwabara sat in his chair, a scowl on his face. The cigar hanging out of his mouth, his full gray beard twitching ever so slightly from the AC. Grizz's right eye focused angrily at the boy, while his other was covered firmly by a black and worn eye patch. This was it. The moment had arrived. Dave knew he was about to receive the punishment of a lifetime for disobeying orders. Grizz stood. There were so many choices that had led to here, but in his heart of hearts, Dave knew that ultimately it was his responsibility to suffer the consequences. He had bet on his instinct and lost. He knew the risks of the wasteland, but he went anyway to prove himself, to show the captain that he was capable. Grizz put out his cigar. Over the last few days, the wasteland should have killed our hero. The heat from the desert, the yeti who chased them, the shogun soldiers. It was a miracle that Dave was still alive. Those poor people in Shiel. If Dave hadn't have been there, they'd still have their children captured by the shogun. At least Dave had done some good on his trip even if he was now in hot water. Grizz walked slowly towards Dave. But all he's ever wanted was to see the world, to travel across the wasteland and maybe even find out why he was here. What had happened to his parents? What was his purpose in all of this? Okay, maybe that's a lot to find out, but every journey begins with a first step, and sometimes that first step needs to become the ground falling out from underneath you. Grizz stopped directly in front of Dave, his one good eye peering down at the young boy. Hanging his head, Dave waited. Here it was. The screams, the swears, the overwhelming overwhelming sense of disappointment. Here it comes, right here. Just like that time, that time Dave dropped all those ice creams and he was sent to fetch for the office, or, or what he couldn't remember if the delivery went to uh, 153 2nd Street or 235 1st Street. Grizz reached his hand up and onto Dave's shoulder, and then pulled the boy close in for an embrace. I was so worried. Thank the gods you returned to me alive. Sincerity looked good on Grizz. Tears fell down both their faces. I'm sorry, Dad, Dave cried. I'm I'm so, so sorry. End of chapter.